So good morning, welcome. Thank you for taking part of your weekend to come and visit us at the Faculty of Engineering. My name is Professor Rosalind Archer and it's my, my pleasure and my privilege to be the head of the Department of Engineering Science. That department offers uh, two degrees, degrees in both engineering science and biomedical engineering. So this talk will duck and dive and kind of weave uh, ideas from both degrees uh, throughout the talk. And the degrees are united by this idea of mathematical modeling. We kind of communicate, we think about the world in terms of mathematics. And what gets us out of bed in the morning is not coffee, I don't actually touch the stuff. It's, it's making a difference in the world. It's using mathematics to do something in the real world. Uh, and by the real world, I mean things that have impact for businesses, for communities, uh, for governments, a range of applications driven by real people uh, and real things. So we take those problems that we find, and I've got most of the talk uh, hinges around describing just examples of some of those problems. And we take those problems and we translate them into mathematics. So for those of you at school, it's like those word problems where there's a whole paragraph of text and it's like, where's the numbers, where's the equations? We go out and find those equations, find those equations that describe real things, and we create ways to solve them. Now the catch with the equations we write down is they're often not well set up to being solved on a piece of paper. So if you're doing calculus at the moment, you're probably able to write down a bunch of equations on a piece of paper and probably solve them. Um, I'm kind of good at maths, but I typically write down equations I can't solve. Uh, and that might be because of the number of equations. Sometimes I joke that it's a good day if I've solved a million equations before breakfast. I guess by that metric, today is not a good day, but I'll, I'll give myself off the day off from doing maths. But to solve a million equations before breakfast, I need to teach my computer to do it because I don't want to solve a million equations by hand. You know, for those of you that can do simultaneous equations, two at once, yeah, fine. Three at once, okay. Four at once, getting annoying, but we can do that. A million at once, same maths, just really, really boring if we do it ourselves. So we get the computer to do the fun part. So by getting the computer to grind through those equations, it really frees us up in terms of creativity. So the computer part um, involves teaching computers to do maths, which does mean that at each year in our degree, you will be doing some coding. So all first year engineers learn MATLAB and C. Uh, normally I'm in the first year teaching uh, that MATLAB section. Uh, and actually if you want to demo on um, learning to code. We have demos going downstairs where you can sit down and have a go at learning to code. Um, but we don't assume that you know how to code. So if you've never done any computer programming, don't panic. All I assume is that you can drive a computer well enough to start a web browser and figure out which lecture theatre to turn up in. And you've all, all passed that test already. So we do computer programming really because it helps us do maths, okay? We, we do computer programming because it gives us scope to make impact in this range of problems that we want to work on. So, what are the degrees like? I had to sneak a little bit of maths in. I haven't, I'm managing to get through half an hour or so with no equations, but I snuck in a couple of Venn diagrams that describe the engineering science degree as the intersection of several different fields around operations research, which is the science of doing things better, data analytics, which is uh, essentially about learning from data, so there are things like machine learning and big data in there, and computational engineering, which is about some of the mathematical work we do to describe systems and materials and processes. And these get it applied in a huge range of places, and drawing on skills in maths, physics, programming, etc. If you turn that into the biomed degree, the same kind of philosophy is there. We drop out some of the mathematics and we add in more material on instrumentation because the bioengineers like to measure really zany things, uh, properties of skin, muscle, tendon, uh, materials uh, in the human body that are extremely elastic and that makes them quite intriguing. 
Um, so we add in a bit more instrumentation. We add in content in the biomedical degree from the medical school. So if you did biomedical, you would be involved in classes that are run by the medical school, BioSci 107, MedSci 142, uh, where there are people in a range of other medical fields. Um, I'll just get into some of the questions. We love applications. So what is it that we do? We're all driven by the sense of possibility. Can we go and do stuff? Um, so all these questions uh, have some graphics that are pretty much exclusively drawn from student work. Uh, and a lot of that student work is done in the final year of their degree. The, um, both degrees have a component, a project-based component, that is 25% of their final year. Um, so I grabbed a lot of the images from student projects. So can we? Can we prevent stress fractures? So if you're a runner, you know that the impact of running puts a lot of load, and with each kind of pound of the pavement, a lot of load into the lower leg. And that load accumulates, causes stress fractures. Can we prevent that? So with some stuff involving um, understanding the mechanical properties of bone, understanding the loads, understanding the forces, uh, this, these images come from a fourth year student who had a, a project calculating the loads that were accumulating on leg bones. And this feeds into some work that one of our spin-out companies is doing where they uh, are creating instrumentation for runners where you can strap a sensor to your leg or to a shoe, keeps track of the loading on your lower leg and sends you an alert on your phone to say, hey, you're getting close to stress fracture territory. You can't feel the symptoms yet, but you've loaded up your leg so much that how about you back off the training this week? Um, if we take that through into the clinical context, so biomedical engineers, sometimes I get asked about the clinical side of things. Biomedical engineers don't work directly with patients. You have to be a doctor to do that. But typically biomedical engineers work with doctors and people who work with patients. So you're not front facing in terms of working with patients. But we do a lot of stuff that is interested in patient outcomes. And one of those outcomes is orthopedic surgery. So I've had a couple of orthopedic operations, bone operations. I don't recommend it, it's not fun. And we want those operations to work. So can we predict in advance if it's going to work? So one thing that we're interested in is personalized medicine. So can we take a bunch of imaging data, MRI scans, gait scans, so these little dots and motion trackers, you might have seen like in the movies for motion tracking for animation, same kind of tracking. Can we take that data and create a personalized custom computer version of a joint or a, a system of joints? Estimate the forces, so here we're particularly interested in the hip. Uh, so I, I have an interest in this, so I'm assured I'm going to need a hip replacement when I'm a little older, because uh, I have a slightly dodgy hip. So can you make a computerized version of a particular person, plan the surgery on the computer to make sure everything's sized right, all the um, uh, loadings are going to work, and figure out does that match what actually happens. So can you get better outcomes through better surgical planning? And again, this is work that was worked on by a biomedical undergraduate, using a lot of sort of standard engineering thinking about force load deformation that regular engineers would apply to engineering materials like concrete, wood, and steel, but applying to the materials of the human body. Um, in that same kind of vein, can we 3D print cool stuff? Uh, I don't think we've got much 3D printing on our display, but next door to us, the mechanical engineers have got 3D printed guitars that you can actually play, and they were sounding pretty cool uh, this morning when they were testing them out. Uh, so we've got an interest in can you 3D print custom joint replacements? If you know exactly what shape it's got to be, how big it's got to be, can you make a re joint replacement particularly for a person? So we collaborate on this with a company called OSIS in Christchurch who are able to 3D print in titanium, make personalized hip replacements uh, using some of the computer modeling that we're interested in. Um, changing track a little, many of us are probably interested in New Zealand's environment and our um, carbon uh, profile, uh, our CO2 emissions budget. And New Zealand, as many of you probably know, is kind of quirky in terms of its CO2 emissions. 
because of our agricultural emissions. We have a huge amount of our emissions comes from sheep and cows. So can engineers do anything about that? So we had, uh, in this case, it was actually an engineering science student looking at the fluid mechanics that control the mixing and the processes inside a sheep rumen, which is um, essentially their stomach. So there we have a sheep going through a scanner, taking scans of the sheep's stomach, creating a computer model of the stomach to try and understand those processes. And then that helps other agricultural experimental folks uh, understand the results of potentially feeding sheep um, different grass varieties and those kinds of things. Again, in the computer imaging space, breast cancer is a wicked, wicked problem. I'm sure it has affected some of your families, and I, I'm very sorry if that is the case. But breast cancer is particularly challenging because of the imaging involved. The imaging involved to detect breast tumours has women, some of the scans, you have them lying down, some you have them standing up. There's all sorts of compression involved in all sorts of uncomfortable ways. Um, being tested for breast cancer, not fun. And you come back with a bunch of these images. And these images are what the clinicians have to use to locate exactly where the tumour is in 3D. How big is it? Is it changing? Um, and this is actually a really challenging process because the scans are all using different tools and different geometries. The team in bioengineering are actually world leaders in the research space in this. They now have a data pipeline, they have a fast data pipeline to Auckland Hospital, where there are now women who go through scans at Auckland Hospital, uh, their scan data comes through to us, uh, it's crunched computationally to get a personalised interpretation of how the scans will, will connect. By the time that the woman is changed and has kind of got their clothes on is, and is out to see the doctor, the data is back with their doctor from us um, to help give them a very, very precise understanding of the nature and the location of their tumour. Very cool, supported by um, an awesome th philanthropic donor who has an interest in the sector. Um, changing track a little, can we make the world safer in terms of transport? So um, this again is a, a materials problem, that if you design vehicles that are lighter, they're more fuel efficient, but are those materials going to be strong enough? What's going to happen if they crash? So if you're in a light, flimsy vehicle that's cheap to run, and it crashes, and you are horribly injured, that is not a great outcome. So can we make uh, those materials in ways that are safe? So here's some crash test modelling. This is a boat. This is a computational model of a boat slamming into some waves. Uh, it's a little hard to see, but yeah, there's the hull of a boat in a lab-scale experiment crashing into the water. So people are looking at what goes on in the lab, what goes on in the computer. The computer's a great place to do design because you can test out a lot of zany stuff without the expense. And you can think about, can I use different materials in new ways? Along the lines of continuing to use different materials, can you take those different materials, the fibre composites, uh, into space? We do some work with Rocket Labs, we do some work with the America's Cup teams, we've worked with the Cup teams for a long time. Um, and those materials have to be um, absolutely perfect without defects, because those defects could cause fractures. So there's some acoustic emission data, uh, looking at testing Fiber carb, um, carbon fibre materials that are going into rocket components to understand if they're going to fail. Um, we have some composite materials on display on our stand, um, including some components from um, America's Cup testing. And then another cool place to think in the material space is bio-based materials. So there is a bit of a plague of plastic in this world. We're all trying to figure out how to recycle it, what to do with it, but could we eliminate plastic? Could we make materials from biologically based things? So that's not as crazy as it sounds. If you've gone to the supermarket and bought those admittedly plastic boxes of kiwi fruit where you get a free spoon, there's a group in Rotorua at Scion who are making those plastic spoons out of a bioplastic made of kiwi fruit waste. Um, so we have technology to start to do stuff like that. Uh, we're doing some really fundamental work on those bio um, polymers 
uh, going down to scanning electron microscope scope level, looking at the kind of molecular structure up to larger scale structures to understand how those bioplastic type materials behave. Can you 3D print them? How strong are they going to be? What sort of mechanical properties would they have? Um, we're also interested in climate change adaptation, um, thinking about uh, the fact that if you're at the coast, we are going to probably see much more extreme events, uh, large waves. How are our coastlines going to cope if they're hammered by large waves? So there's a computational model of a large wave being created, thinking about forces that are created. There's some lab testing, um, but we're really trying to think about the impacts on um, coastal communities. My personal interest, uh, I started my career as a petroleum engineer, worked more recently as a geothermal engineer, is to look underground. I want X-ray vision. I really want to see 5K under the ground to know what's under there. Is there do I have oil, water, gas, hot water? Um, I haven't quite invented X-ray vision, still working on that. Um, but the nearest we've got right now is some sort of geophysical techniques. So these are images from a, a colleague where he's looking at some sort of geophysical data to say what kind of signals can I put into the earth, what can I understand about the earth, can I use that data processing to understand where do I put my next geothermal well, which could cost me $10 million, or if it's an oil well, could cost me $100 million, where do I put that to make sure it's in the best possible location? Uh, and then the group that do what's called operations research, which is about making things better, faster, or cheaper. Uh, I have an example of one of the questions that keeps them awake at night uh, from the pathology unit at the hospital. So pathology is, is about disease diagnosis. They get lots of samples in right through the day. Different tests take different amount of time, need people with different skills. So we've done work with scheduling in that team to make sure that the patients in the hospital can get those lab results quickly. Um, making sure that you've got rosters that give you the right skill set at the right time, but observe the fact that we're working with humans. So I can't go and tell the pathologist, hey, work till 10 o'clock at night, uh, and by the way, you need to be back for the 6 a.m. shift tomorrow. So you're not going to be very happy with me. I need my pathologists to be awake when they interpret. Um, in that same vein, we do a lot of work with Air New Zealand. So if you've flown international on Air New Zealand, all their crew rostering is driven um, by work we do uh, to, first of all, keep the salary cost down, but also maximise the happiness of the crew. So to help with their bid process to say, actually, I don't want to fly to Los Angeles this week, I want to fly to Tokyo. Um, you know, it costs the airline the same amount of money to pay my salary, Let's try and keep me happy and have me fly to Tokyo if that's what I want to do. Um, so Air New Zealand has a really sophisticated system that's built by some of the same sorts of mathematics. One of the projects I get really excited about is work a colleague is doing again in this area of sort of data and optimization. He's using machine learning to link uh, iwi with dividend income. So Maori land trusts have a structure where quite large pieces of land are often owned by hundreds or even thousands of individuals. And as generations of the family proceed, people move around, people lose connection with their um, uh, heritage and their, their land, they lose access to the dividends. So we are working with um, an iwi group in Taranaki uh, that are farming large blocks of land, they have $3 million in cash and dividends that they have to get back to the rightful owners. So we have um, someone who's using machine learning techniques to understand um, some of the familial relationships, to take public domain data from the Maori land court, from birth, deaths and marriages, all sorts of things, to deal with um, name changes, so names that were written in Maori were um, anglicised. Um, so it's quite an interesting problem and is one that is um, giving very tangible benefits to that community. We have people interested in water, so how we manage water, um, both how we manage water to generate electricity, so the um, river schemes that generate electricity, when do I release my water, do I have enough water in my dam? Are the lights going to go out? But also managing water for drinking water purposes. So there's some shots about sort of planning future demand scenarios, understanding 
is there enough water coming in in the different catchments? Uh, Auckland are kind of worried at the moment, despite what it feels like over the past few weeks, that it has actually been really dry this year. I live on tank water, so um, I'm personally quite exposed. Um, making sure that the systems can plan for those dry years. Um, and then finally, some in work from a colleague in wind, thinking about can we design uh, wind turbines, controllers, to survive extreme wind events. So high wind velocities, wind gusts, put a lot of wear and tear on turbines that add to the cost uh, and the maintenance involved. So there's a computer simulation. The red is a gust of high velocity wind going through these little white pieces of the wind turbines, thinking about the impact that gust has as it goes through the farm. So there's a lot of computer time that went into building that. Oh, and the final one is about uh, transport. We've, I've grabbed a slide from someone who's thinking about um, making transport more energy efficient. So they, this is again as a final year student, uh, had access to uh, data from Berlin where uh, the Germans were thinking about controlling speed limits on their road network to manage fuel efficiency. Because we all know if you drive with a really heavy foot, it's not necessarily going to get you the best fuel efficiency. Um, it doesn't always even get you there any, any faster because you just get to a red light faster. Um, so there's some quite clever stuff that can be done around thinking about networks and thinking about adapting um, speed limits, potentially live, um, to try and manage uh, fuel efficiency. I wanted to walk, just wrap up by thinking a little bit more about the climate of our department. We traditionally are one of the smaller programs. We'll be bringing, we have a lot of demand for the program, so I have expanded over the years. We'll be bringing 80 students into second year engineering science and usually 35 into biomedical. Um, but those kinds of numbers are still small enough that you will get to know a lot of people in your class, have a very collegial environment. So in engineering, you do the first year as common. So the first year is the same for everyone. And then you specialize into a department, into a degree specialization in year two. Within two weeks of joining our department, you get put on a bus, actually three or four buses now. Uh, we head off on a field trip. Uh, you get to meet some of the companies that employ our students, some of the former students, and do some team building um, stuff. So these are some of the challenges we have. Um, this is an amazing race kind of challenge, and we had a pit stop where we had to get 12 people doing a handstand all at once in public. Uh, and then finally, I'll just wrap up with a few profiles on our graduates. Uh, Maury Leyland is an example of one of our graduates. She um, has uh, worked for the America's Cup. She's the only woman to have sailed for Team New Zealand. She's continued a bit of a heritage. One of our recent young graduates, Elise Beavis, was the youngest performance engineer in the most recent Cup helped make the case for, instead of having guys grinding on winches with the arms, having the guys on the bikes, she did a lot of number crunching on the computer to argue why that should work. So Maury has gone from designing yachts to designing kind of systems and processes in management consulting and in Fonterra. She's now left Fonterra. Tara Nataraj has had a career um, from engineering science in engineering consultancy, using that very analytical skill set that engineering science people have to give business advice around the world. Joe Rollis, uh, he's interested in materials, strength of materials. He uh, has a bachelor's and a master's in engineering science, has had a long career at Southern Spas down at the Viaduct, looking at high performance yachts. Kim Noakes is, first of all, a high-performance sports person. I had three Olympics in a row. I had to get exam papers to the Olympic Games for people associated with the department who were either competing or were so good in their sport they were kind of their shadowing competitors. A great problem to have, to have to send um, exams to the Olympics. Uh, Kim uh, did a biomedical engineering degree looking at um, her final project was around the pelvic floor. Um, she's headed off to Europe uh, look, uh, with a medical research company. Karen did engineering science uh, a while back. Uh, I did have her picked as being the first Kiwi in space. If you've got interest in aeronautics or astronautics, engineering science is a great place to be. 
She has been a professor at MIT in the US for a long time, recently moved to um, University of Texas at Austin. That picture is here on the Vomit Comet um, and uh, getting uh, some experience of life without gravity. She was uh, very, very close to astronaut selection. Uh, Matthew Lim has a biomedical engineering degree. He's interested in telemetry, so he's part of a spin-out company called Telemetry Research. Um, so this is quite a long-standing spin-out. Um, he joined them in 2006, so they're not flash in the pan. So telemetry is about sending signals, so he puts Bluetooth devices, implantable Bluetooth. So you can have monitoring of um, devices implanted in humans or in lab animals that Bluetooth out to your phone. Uh, and Ian Kim is a, no, no, Ian's not the final one. Ian's in Silicon Valley. Uh, he's doing cardiac modeling work looking at um, devices to support cardiac function. And then I think Vignesh Kumar is a final graduate. He is with Fisher & Paykel Healthcare here in New Zealand. Uh, Fisher & Paykel do have a significant manufacturing operation overseas, but all their R&D is done here in New Zealand. Um, they love Kiwi know-how. So he works on devices for um, uh, breathing support. So I mentioned before, coding, if you want to try out some coding, drop down one level kind of go out to the street and drop down one level. We've got some interactive workshops down there. And um, feel free to follow the faculty on social media. So thank you for your time. If you've got any questions one-on-one, -on -one, feel free to pop down and see me. Enjoy your day. <laughs> <laughs>